Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us today. On behalf of CSIS and the Project for Prosperity and Development, I'm really pleased to welcome you today to this discussion on infrastructure, quality infrastructure, and the sustainable development goals. My name is Kristen Cordell. I'm a visiting fellow with the Project on Prosperity and Development here at CSIS, and I'm really, really excited to be convening a wonderful panel today. Um, part of my work at CSIS has been looking across the SDGs to think about where the US government can creatively re-engage for maximum engagement and efficiency within the 2030 agenda. And I think this is incredibly important on sustainable infrastructure. So we have a great panel to talk to about that idea today. We're joined by Steve Krosky, the Deputy Director of Infrastructure and Project Management for UNOPS, the UN Office for Project Services. Tom Hardy, the Director for Program Management at the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, USTDA, and Tofika Hawk, Senior Infrastructure Finance Specialist at the Global Infrastructure Facility for the World Bank Group, who I should mention is joining us today from Singapore, where it's very late, and we're very, very pleased to have her. Today's discussion is going to be a sort of pre-launch for a report that CSIS will be putting out in a few weeks' time on quality infrastructure as it relates to Agenda 2030. I just wanna quickly preview the report before we move into the discussion because we're really excited about it. Everyone knows that the infrastructure gap is enormous, some $8 trillion and getting larger by the day due to COVID. The last several years have luckily seen a significant rise in consensus, international consensus around the need for high quality infrastructure standards. Japan's leadership on the, in the G20 has been a great example in this space. Because of those efforts and international consensus, there's been a lot of continuing um, projects and programs to set standards and criteria, including the innovative US government Blue Dot Network as an example. But the challenge remains on how those standards will become meaningful in developing countries and what it will actually take to implement those new criteria across the developing world. The report will lay out a number of action steps that policymakers and practitioners can take using specifically the sustainable development goals and agenda 2030 to build on common consensus around the importance of quality infrastructure standards in the developing world. The recommendations will look across different activities such as technical assistance and advisory services and highlight how we can work together to ensure that quality standards become meaningful in the developing world. We think this is incredibly important for achieving the objectives of SDG 9. So with that preview in mind, I'd like to open up the discussion to our panelists today. I'd like to start with Steve from UN Ops. Steve, as a as a representative of the UN, you know a lot about SDG 9 and Agenda 2030. Tell us how UN Ops has been thinking about SDG 9 implementation as it relates to high quality infrastructure. Great, thank you very much for that introduction and, and, and for inviting us here. We're very, very happy to be part of this discussion. Uh, it's long been an area of great importance for us. Um, and so, just over the next five minutes, I'll just give a quick overview of uh, you know, what we've been doing in this space and, and, and why we feel it's so important. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, I'm working for UNOPS, UNOP, UN Pro Office for Project Services. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of context because we have a specific mandate and a role um, and we work in, in a specific area. So I think it's worth knowing where we're coming from uh, on this uh, initially. We're, uh, we're a project-based organization, so we have no core UN funding. Uh, we work very much in a kind of private sector uh, uh, way within the UN family. Uh, we have, uh, being a project-based organization, we have around 900 projects every year. We deliver around $2.3 billion uh, in these projects in a year. Um, we're the only agency with infrastructure in our mandate. Uh, and of course, this is why we're taking this uh, you know, you know, very, very seriously and trying to understand uh, how better we can support governments uh, in infrastructure. Typically, in the past, we've been doing a lot of implementation, um, technical assistance as well, obviously, and uh, some advisory services. And I think uh, most of our work has been in sort of least developed uh, countries. 
some work in middle income countries that's been growing particularly in latin america but mostly most of our work is implementing and supporting governments in fragile conflict affected states these types of areas so um capacity is weak uh, and, and that's why we're there uh, to support governments implement projects and improve and build capacity um the sdgs came about obviously 2015 uh, 2016 and then you, you know the, the sendai framework the paris agreement around climate change and really that's led us as an organization of the last couple of years to really think very critically around the importance of infrastructure and how we can utilize what we're doing to support governments in this area uh, and in helping them achieve long-term aims around the sdgs and other national uh, development uh, agendas um and obviously infrastructure you know it's, it goes without saying it's it's it provides the framework for development the services the infrastructure provides uh, allows governments to to create uh, uh, employment opportunities it creates the environment for for social uh, uh, interaction uh, and, and empowerment, etc. So, it, 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 and, and being clear, what I must actually quickly say is, when I talk about infrastructure, I think we all we all think of infrastructure maybe as, as, as maybe something slightly different. But just to be clear from our side, I mean, I'm talking about when I say infrastructure, pretty much I'm talking about all the built uh, aspects across the the, the, the traditional sectors. Um, but also, you know, we're talking about the hospitals and schools and buildings, all the other things that uh, that rely on those network of uh, other infrastructure, such as energy and transport, etc. So it's very broad, uh, and I think that's important to say because uh, some people see that in a different way. We really needed to understand uh, what the SDGs mean and how we can better support them. So, you know, we've been looking to partner over the last few years with, with a whole range of people. Uh, professional institutions um, like the Institute of Civil Engineers in the UK, the American Society of Civil Engineers. But one of our biggest partners has been Oxford University, um, the Infrastructure Transitions Research Consortium, who've been doing a lot of great work over the last 10, 12 years in the UK in terms of modelling uh, national infrastructure. And we wanted to see how that we, we could use that to enhance what we were, were supporting governments for. And the first thing we do is we work with Oxford looking at the SDGs themselves which are a great set of goals, 17 goals, sitting under that a whole range of targets and then under that the indicators. Uh, we focused on the targets, the 169 targets, that's a very tangible place to, to start uh, doing some research and understanding what infrastructure's role is in across the SDGs. Uh, and through this we, we created a, um, a research with Oxford University linking infra different infrastructure sectors to the ability to influence these targets. Of course, that influence could be positive or negative, um, but it's important to know what, what does influence what. Um, and, and across the 169 targets, we, we, we looked at the whole range of uh, in infrastructure. Around 92% of those targets are directly influenced by infrastructure. So, I mean, immediately there, how important is infrastructure for the attainment of the SDGs? Sustainable infrastructure is is at the heart of it um, uh, and at least recognized in, in SDG 9 uh, to some extent. Um, a, few, a few other headlines, for instance, water influences 37% of SDG targets, 43% uh, energy, transportation, 45% of targets. Um, the, the biggest one, obviously, is buildings, however you want to call that, healthcare, school, education, etc. 80% of SDG targets um, uh, are influenced by what we do in the building sector for instance. So incredibly important. Uh, understanding that then allows us to, over the last few years, to develop tools to be able to support governments think through this critically, not just to go and implement programs on projects on the ground, you know, uh, in, in a silo based approach, but to also support them at the same time, looking at long term performance of infrastructure assets and how those relate to long term national development. Uh, agendas and the SDGs uh, as well as Paris Agreement. So really what we focused on in, in, in the infrastructure side around this aspect is very much about how do we help implement these great ideals, these great principles, what does that mean in practice for, for governments? Um, and as, as a very quick example, I think um, one work we've done over the last sort of about a year and a half, two years with St Lucia government uh, is where we collaborating with, uh, with the University of Oxford 
uh, we collaborated with them to develop the, the first national infrastructure assessment, which was launched by the Prime Minister in October 2020. Uh, and then using the knowledge and the tools developed by Oxford that we had co-developed in a developing context, we helped them uh, look at their infrastructure assets, how they were performing and how they would perform over time in towards uh, uh, attaining targets under the SDGs. Uh, and so that's a very practical uh, way that we've been trying to uh, move away from just just implementing projects for our partners in infrastructure and actually helping them uh, a bit more critically uh, to, to get to the nub of how we align our infrastructure projects in a portfolio way towards long term uh, development goals and what we can do in the planning phases to align to make sure that we're, we're hitting those targets in the long term. Of course, the decisions we make now have very long term consequences in infrastructure. We may make a decision now and maybe talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 and more years of, uh, of infrastructure life, life cycle. So if we're not thinking about these things now and aligning um, uh, to some extent, then, then you're potentially locking in core development practice for, for the future. Um, um, I think, I, think I'm, I'm, I don't want to run out too much of time. I can go on forever on this one, obviously. A few key takeaways, I think, I think um, sort of best practices and things that we've been seeing through the work with governments is it's very much we need to see strong government commitment to change. And those who really have adopted and using the SDGs as a framework, it becomes a great, great lens and, and, and a way to collaborate effectively in terms of what does it mean? What does sustainability mean in the long term? And, and so that's been important, very much closely linked to capacity as well. So, so yes, there's a real commitment to change, but there's also that, that has to go hand in hand with, with uh, changes uh, in government and, and capacity building and not just going in and delivering something and walking away. It has to be leaving something uh, behind. Um, and, and if I'm honest with you, that this is also about uh, really balancing with the short term thinking that goes on in a lot of governments with the political elements. We're talking infrastructure is very long term. Decisions making now that may, may not uh, <laughs> completely aligned with a, with a short-term political aim is, 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 a, is a real challenge, let's say, uh, and, and should we leave it as that. Uh, breaking down silos in government, that's important as well, and so working across government uh, um, is, is very important. Um, I'll leave it at that because I know there's a lot, lot to do and I'm probably going on, so, uh, so, so I hope that's giving you a bit of a flavour of, of what we're up to. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. That was really uh, excellent. And I think when you hear that statistic about the 92% of the infrastructure necessary to achieve all of the sustainable development goals, you really get a sense of why uh, doing it in a quality way ma matters a lot uh, to achieving those goals um, in the long term. And so certainly we'll come back to you for some more questions and examples of, of what that looks like at the local context. Um, I wanna to turn to Tom from your perch in the US government. Um, we're hearing a lot from the new administration on, on thinking about quality infrastructure, both domestically, but, but also in developing contexts. I'm curious about the, the unique role that US TDA plays in that and how you're thinking about your toolkit. Thank you, Kristen. And let me begin by thanking CSIS for taking this on. I, I think that it is an opportune time uh, obviously, to be talking about quality infrastructure and the standards um, that uh, we all need to be focused on, which is high quality standards. How do we ensure that the work we're doing um, to support economic development in emerging markets is being done, that these countries get the best return on their investment? And I think looking at from USTDA's perspective, high quality infrastructure standards are the centerpiece and building block of everything we see. Uh, Every, from the very beginning of what USTDA does, and I think it follows perfectly on what he was just saying, is it has to be defined correctly. You have to have quality in, in the thought process when you're developing a project. And that is the role of USTDA. As the US government's project preparation agency, our goal is to specifically design projects focused on quality. Our mission is dual. One is focused on the local developmental impacts of our work, but also doing it in a way that opens the markets for U.S. goods and services, quality of products that American companies sell into emerging markets. How do we do this? It's through a grant 
grant-based program, whether it's feasibility studies, technical assistance, pilot projects, all of our investment is designed to be invested in designing infrastructure projects in a way that focuses on the. And by being involved in the earliest stages of de development, we help companies to compete on the basis of quality. That's USTDA in a nutshell. That's what we do as a as the model. And I think that it goes to what Steve was saying, but I think the quality infrastructure has taken on a new life of its own. Um, starting in 2009 for USTDA, we actually saw firsthand, um, particularly in Africa, I was working in Africa at the time and started seeing um, projects fail, low quality solutions, low quality products being deployed in Africa. And we started hearing from our partners in Africa that they wanted an alternative. They didn't like the product they were getting. They were investing money and having to reinvest and reinvest to get a product and service that should have work the first time. So what we did in 2009 as an agency is every project we support through feasibility studies, technical assistance, pilot projects has a component that requires the analysis of best value, life cycle costs to help the project developer understand different alternative procurement alternatives to move forward their investment. And much like Steve was saying, when we think investment infrastructure, we think of energy, telecommunications, uh, transportation. So every investment we're making in the project preparation side of our portfolio has a commitment to best value life cycle cost analysis to help our partners make sure that they're making informed decisions on the best quality and the best value for their dollars. Um, and that went on for about three or four years. And we continued to hear more and more. And this time we heard um, from, from our partners in Asia and that US companies weren't competing. US companies weren't offering tender, weren't offering bids on big tenders for major infrastructure projects. And we went to US industry and said, what's going on? Why there's huge investments going on in Asia. And what we heard from US industry is they weren't willing to be going after a lot of these big projects because the procurement was based on lowest cost. So USTDA set up what's called the Global Procurement Initiative, whose whole focus is on developing procurement professionals in high growth markets that have the capacity and have the legal and regulatory structures in place to incorporate best value uh, and life cycle cost analysis into their procurement process. Since 2013, when we launched this, we have um, right now about 17 countries that we're working hand in glove with to help build the capacity, build the professionalization of the workforce to incorporate best, best value uh, procurement, not just in what USTDA is investing in, but as at the country level, at the municipal level that they are able to incorporate quality standards into their uh, procurements, procurement processes. And it's been a, a great project, great undertaking from us that we've been able to get in and help our partners fully understand how by doing the procurement right at the beginning can prove that they get better quality at the end as opposed to just simply looking at the lowest cost and, and running, with, running with the lowest cost. And, this partnership, and much like your paper talks about, Kristen, is, is predicated on not a necessarily a U.S. solution, but a quality solution in, in a way that USTDA has not in the past, is we've actually now partnered with Japan, and we're working throughout the Indo-Pacific hand, uh, hand in hand with Japan on supporting um, collectively uh, Japan's quality infrastructure initiative and marrying it with our global procurement initiative to demonstrate a quality solution as opposed to a US solution or Japanese solution or Chinese solution. But it's a it's a approach that has received strong support and we've been able to work, Japan's called us in, we've called Japan in to do training in a way that demonstrates the quality that you get by investing in a little bit more upfront and the long-term longevity of the investments that are, are made. I think I'll end it there just recognizing the time, but I think that the, this is a opportune time um, as the world is really at the 
tipping point of where do they want to go? Is it going to be quality infrastructure or is it going to be dri driven simply by the lowest cost alternative? And I think that for countries to make informed investment decisions for countries to be able to invest in infrastructure that serves their people the best, we need to be focused on pushing a quality infrastructure agenda that provides the greatest return on investment for our partners around the world. And with that, I'll turn it over back over to you, Chris, and really look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that, those remarks. I think uh, the piece on bilateral partnerships is, is really important um, as the, the current administration moves forward on these issues. I know Japan has been a great partnership. I know the work with Australia has been has been really remarkable in this space. And, and I think that showing both the Steve's point on the multilateral structure and your point on the bilateral partnerships is a really um, helpful, helpful point that comes across in the paper as well. Um, I'd like to turn over to Tafika now. Um, Tafika, the M MDBs are such a central partner um, in financing sustainable quality infrastructure projects. Um, can you tell about us a little bit more about the Global Infrastructure Facility and what you're learning in this space? Thanks, Kristen. Um, thank you very much uh, for having us and thanks to CSIS. Um, I'm coming in after Steve and Tom. So Steve actually took all a lot of the figures I wanted to give on the uh, people without access, because I think, you know, why are we talking about infrastructure? Why is it so important? Um, and today, more so than ever, uh, if you look at stimulus plans around the world, be it uh, the new administration's infrastructure uh, plan for um, the, the new deal uh, that the new administration is putting forward is centered with infrastructure delivery. Um, and if you look even at the origins of uh, the World Bank, we were, we were created uh, post-World War II, looking at reconstructing, um, reconstructing Europe uh, with, um, with the Marshall Plan being at the core of it, which was rebuilding the infrastructure that had been destroyed by, by the war. So today in developed, as well as emerging markets, um, the stimulus plans to come out of COVID are really centered around uh, infrastructure uh, delivery to, to boost growth, um, to look for efficient growth also. So uh, as I was saying, just, just so we can try to imagine um, what we are talking about. The World Bank estimates that we have 940 million people around the world still living without electricity. Um, we have 60, 600, um, nearly 700 million people without access to uh, drinking water. So these are real numbers. These are in, in even pre-COVID worlds. I think these numbers are from 2019. So um, this is a reality today. Um, 2.4 billion without, uh, in, um, without access to sanitation facilities. Um, and while we have these dilemma and these needs on one side, uh, we also have very restricted uh, government budgets. Um, so infrastructure uh, is considered as a public good uh, where bulk of infrastructure is uh, financed or funded through uh, the public sector, either through tax collections or revenue collections. Um, but with limited uh, public budgets and the large uh, demands on budget, there is really a need to mobilize uh, beyond uh, public sector budget, beyond uh, MDBs like ourselves or bilaterals such as the US, Japan, um, even China, uh, and to look at uh, untapped markets, meaning uh, private investments. And um, that brings me in a long about way of uh, putting uh, the GIF into context. So what is the global infrastructure facility? We are housed within the World Bank, but we are a global uh, a platform of collaboration between MDBs, uh, between emerging market countries, and um, importantly, um, uh, uh, private investors looking at uh, putting their money in infrastructure uh, assets. And um, this is really the, the core um, of the GIF, which is how do we bring about, how do we help prepare uh, infrastructure transactions for in emerging markets, which will be able to attract commercial financing? <clears throat> because um, 
there, we, ha we have been for a very long time in a low interest rate environment with uh, institutional investors, private investors looking for um, investment opportunities where they can place, especially pension funds and, uh, and um, institutional investors who have long-term liabilities looking for long-term long assets where to invest uh, their monies. And infrastructure is a natural fit, um, but um, already institutional investors are look cautiously at infrastructure projects in more developed markets. In emerging markets, it still remains quite exotic. And that is uh, before the pandemic, post-pandemic, uh, or as we come out of the pandemic, it's still very much uh, in there. So the GIF was created in uh, 2014 and uh, spearheaded by the World Bank, but it was really a G20 initiative um, under the Australian presidency where the task at hand was so much need in infrastructure. So I think Steve mentioned uh, 9 trillion. We have uh, figures of what, 1 trillion annually uh, um, in emerging Asia. Basically, the numbers are huge. Um, and... Uh, um, constrained uh, financing. So we, uh, the World Bank had actually uh, from uh, various uh, engagements that we have, uh, had uh, um, been looking uh, in discussions with the private sector, asking where, what is the main obstacle uh, to putting money in uh, um, infrastructure assets other than, uh, I don't know if I can't remember if it was Tom or Steve who mentioned, uh, political stability, um, commercial returns, economic returns, I think one of the key uh, issues that is raised is we would we, we can look at uh, finding mitigants for the political stability, commercial um, uh, risks that can be in projects, but the core problem is finding um, bankable transactions, uh, infrastructure projects in which um, investors are willing to put in their money. So that, that was the genesis of the GIF. We, um, together with the um, donor uh, funding in, and the World Bank, we uh, got together and said, okay, we're going to have a platform, we'll establish a platform that's not just going to be helping um, World Bank or World Bank group projects um, and, and the private sector arm of the World Bank being the IFC, but we are going to open it up uh, to have uh, most impact and most access. So. We have uh, we work together with um, uh, all of the uh, MDBs uh, in preparing transactions. And by preparing, what do I mean? It's uh, looking at infrastructure projects, uh, doing the uh, the hardcore due diligence work of pre feasibility study, feasibility study, um, and structuring. And looking at um, if you are looking at bringing in the private sector, what risks can the private sector bear? and still leave the project as being affordable um, and, um, um, and, and delivering results, um, quality results. And uh, Tom uh, spoke um, about uh, quality infrastructure, the QII principle, as we call it in uh, our line of business. So again, quality infrastructure was, uh, I think, was uh, really brought forward with, uh, with another uh, G20 presidency under uh, Japan, uh, I think back in 2015, where um, the push is to look at infrastructure through a life cycle. Uh, so not just, just the investments, to take an example of getting a road built, but um, getting that road built in, um, we have a project going on in uh, Papua New Guinea, in the Pacific, where um, uh, tornadoes, cyclones, uh, earthquakes are, are real, so you need to build that infrastructure in view of what are the climatic conditions um, in that, and, and make the necessary adjustments to uh, the design, uh, the engineering, to make sure that that road is going to be there for the next 50, uh, 60 years. With uh, the angle, and this is very much the GIF angle, is uh, how do we bring in the private investor? What risk can we allocate to the private investor and let them earn a return? Because investors do uh, look for returns while still making the project affordable to the governments, um, for the government. So that's where the nexus of the GIF of sitting uh, together with both public financing and bringing in private financing is critical because uh, 
The good, um, Tom mentioned that uh, procurement processes often are driven, um, government clients look at the cheapest cost. Um, if you have built a house or you, you must have faced similar situations also, you would really like to have the high end uh, kitchen design, but you can only afford so much. So you may be driven by, uh, by cost concerns. So um, we look at it, as we, as we were saying, from a, a whole life cycle angle uh, of building the road for the road to be there and not to wash away it with the first uh, cyclone because that's lost money, but finding solutions for governments to, um, to bridge that uh, additional costs and, and to make the road affordable uh, over the long term. So bringing in public concessional funds when necessary, and uh, attracting the private investors. Um, and for us, so our work is very much focused on uh, SDG 9, I mean, infrastructure. Uh, we carry it in our name, we carry it in our everyday uh, work. Um, and we, we do have also additional uh, angles that we look at, which is um, sustainable and uh, climate smart. Um, we have uh, uh, about 74% of our uh, we have currently 104 projects under preparation, which could uh, attract uh, over $74 billion of private investments uh, and over $100 billion of investments uh, um, in total. So we do um, work on those projects looking at the long term, at the delivery and affordability uh, from a, uh, an emerging market uh, client perspective. So maybe just to, to wrap up and end some examples of uh, transactions that we do and, and to give a flavor of what does it mean, this collaboration among MDBs. Um, I'm based here in, in uh, Singapore. Uh, we are working with um, the World Bank on establishing, uh, we have established a geothermal resharing facility. Uh, geothermal Indonesia sits uh, on the ring of fire, literally has uh, the capacity of uh, generating probably around 40 gigawatts of uh, geothermal clean energy. And yet uh, Indonesia has only developed uh, a fraction of that um, and remains one of the largest emitter of uh, CO2 with the um, large uh, baseload of coal production. And what we have done together with, um, with the World Bank is establish uh, with the World Bank and the Green Climate Fund is this facility which extends, um, extends financing to the private sector to be able to go and, and do the uh, geothermal uh, exploration to prove the resources um, that, that are, should be in place. And uh, once those resources are proven that they can uh, borrow, um, uh, they can launch into um, uh, uh, putting in place uh, power plants. If the resources, uh, what our facility allows is that if those resources are not available, and that's the highest, uh, that's the riskiest part of a geothermal power plant's uh, life cycle, um, our funds, there is uh, a mechanism of forgiveness uh, so that the, the investors can then look into another site. Um, that facility would have, we, uh, we have extended, we as in, GIF, the World Bank, the Green Climate Fund have extended uh, financing of uh, around $200 million, but it has the potential of scaling up and uh, mobilizing over $6 billion of uh, um, private financing in delivering um, around uh, 10 gigawatts of geothermal energy. So that's um, a live example of a project uh, that uh, we are working on. Um, Maybe I, I uh, maybe just to give another example in uh, buildings. I think uh, I can't remember if it was Tim or, or Steve or Tom who mentioned it. Um, public, um, especially in uh, today's context, uh, we're working with uh, in the Philippines uh, with uh, the largest uh, university hospital in building um, in uh, structuring a PPP cardiac center, which will be um, so. If you know Manila uh, or, or the Philippines, it again sits on a, um, uh, it's a very seismic area. So the, the building is being built with um, um, green building 
um, principles of the IFC. So on that project, we're working together with the IFC, which includes in their uh, necessary investments to to meet the uh, to be for the building to be resilient to the climatic conditions, to be uh, green in emissions and uh, energy efficiency. And that project will be delivered. Um, it will be the government uh, contracting with the private sector partner to build and operate the facility and provide. I think Topic is having just a little bit of audio trouble. Um, so we will pick up on a theme that she um, raised really nicely and gave us some great examples of on um, the private sector de-risking and, and sort of catalytic funding. Um, I thought the Indonesia um, and Philippines examples were, were excellent. So thanks for those. I wanna go over and ask um, Steve and then Tom really the same question. If you've seen any examples of, of uh, either multilateral bilateral efforts to really engage the private sector because it, it really did come across in our report that this is a key um, ingredient to getting this quality infrastructure a recipe right. So Steve, why don't we go to you for any private sector uh, examples you'd like to share? Yeah, just, just, just quickly, I think it was being or I found very interesting uh, recently. I mean, obviously, going back to the theme of the SDGs, SDG 17 partnerships is all, all really about that. The recognition, some would say, finally, from the UN system that you know we need to be looking much broader uh, across private sector to support governments than maybe has been done in the past. Uh, so the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs has been setting up some SDG fairs where they're matching uh, countries uh, who can bring projects to uh, to um, uh, a discussion to a panel of um, private sector investors who are interested. And I think that's interesting for several reasons. I mean, we, we looked at 89 top infrastructure funds um, just to get that understanding and, and, and all but one of them had clear indications that they wanted to see links to the SDGs in terms of outcomes and impacts in, in the future. So that's where the market's going and, and, and that's clear. So, so all the stuff I talked about while trying to help governments earlier understand and align portfolios to SDGs is, is all lovely and great, but what's it for? It's, it's, it's also for them to be able to attract more sources of potential for private sector funding to, to fund these projects. Um, and also, um, can allow us, uh, and in this, this case, what we do is we help the, the government of Ghana take their projects that they were interested in funding and help them think through these links to the SDGs from the research with Oxford and create an evidence-based uh, framework to, to put these projects in that they could take to this investment fair and present uh, to, to potential investors, uh, but framed very clearly around this is, this is how it fits in with our long-term plan and the SDGs. So I think that was, that, that was very interesting and there's gonna be more of that coming. And I think that's, that's, that's the sort of thing we need to see uh, happening far more. Absolutely. Tom, anything to add on the private sector discussion related to procurement or otherwise? Yeah, uh, yes, thank you. I think looking at your portfolio in total, about a little over a third of our projects are focused on private sector development projects. and. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, when you think of heavy infrastructure, so much of that is driven by governments, the state government, municipal governments, but it's that small infrastructure that makes the daily lives of people better. Uh, and when I look around the world and the investments we're making in the quality infrastructure, I think of like in South Africa, we're working with a developer on harnessing what's called digital white space, which is uh, uh, bandwidth, this unused bandwidth, to provide high-speed internet to remote areas. Um, working by investing with US technology, US know-how in helping South Africa define how to build out broadband Wi-Fi access, it's going to drive in, bring in new investment, new private sector-led investment, but it's also providing a, a on top of that, of kind of a quality U.S. solution. And I, I, I go a lot to Africa um, just because that's where there's so much interest and so much uh, excitement um, and in the energy space as well. I think what we're seeing is a lot of developers, mini grid developers, off grid. Uh, there's a lot of investment going in by the U.S. government, not, not just U.S. TDA, but AID and others on helping 
private sector developers build out off-grid uh, technologies. And I think if you look around the U.S. industry, U.S. economy, you're seeing a lot of organic growth in these solutions that meet the needs of um, our partners across Africa. And so we're making a lot of investments in the energy side. And then in Asia, I think that Asia is a, a driver for us um, as an agency, um, whether it be energy, transport, or um, ICT, we've seen good opportunities to crowd in investment, but crowd in financing. And, and I think that's one of the unique things about USTDA is it's not tied to any one source. So the work we're doing is designed to unlock financing from any source, whether it be the World Bank, IFC, multilaterals, or commercial banks. I think that, that's really the sweet spot for us is being able to make these investments, help our partners make better informed investment decisions. And that will drive in, I think what Steve was saying, drive in new financing opportunities uh, where you see where they can make that case that there's quality and there's a return on the investment, a strong return on the investment. Great, thanks. I know we already have one question um, in the chat. If you are attending and you're interested in asking um, one or a couple of our panelists a question, please feel free to, to go ahead and send us a question. Um, Tafik, I just wanted to ask if you had anything you wanted to add on the private sector piece. You broke up a little at the end of your Philippines example, which, which was great. And I just wanted to see if you wanted to add anything before I move to my next question. Thanks, Kristen. And I think one of the questions that has come up um, is also about uh, um, what to do, what are one of the challenges of bringing bankable projects. So that's, as I was mentioning earlier, very much the space we are in. So we have the work on, on project preparation, um, what we call our day-to-day -day work. But at the same time, we also work a lot with uh, um, on partnership and alliances with uh, the private sector. So if I can just mention three of them um, that we are working with. With, uh, with Bloomberg, um, uh, we are working on something called the, uh, uh, on looking at city at country level platforms to look at um, what are the um, obstacles uh, to unblock private financing. And this is together with, um, with uh, leading investors uh, who are interested in putting their, their money, their investments in uh, a selection of countries. And uh, the work that we, we are uh, designing is looking at both the uh, upstream policy decisions that need to uh, be reformed and at the same time uh, working from bottom up on transactions. So really going at it uh, through the whole as in infrastructure we call from the upstream to the downstream. Uh, so a package of solutions, not just um, uh, not just uh, MDBs with the uh, developing uh, country, but MDBs, developing country, private sector investors, all coming and sitting at the table and working on actual transactions together. Um, so that's an example. Another uh, work that we have been leading with um, um, uh, commercial banks and investors, as well as um, other uh, MDBs is uh, something called the uh, fast infra. Uh, so it's the finance to accelerate sustainable uh, transition uh, in infrastructure. And it's uh, an initiative that was sent, uh, that was launched uh, under uh, the French presidency's uh, open uh, lab uh, initiative about two years ago. And uh, the GIF is a funding member of that together with uh, HSBC um, um, and uh, other parties where we are looking, um, and it's been something that's been really dr been driven by the private sector saying, okay, how are we going to put our money in infrastructure? So it's, um, I've been in the MDB world for quite a long time, always working with the private sector partners, but here where they are having the dialogues where that we MDBs or, or UN or uh, DFIs are having, but they are sitting at the table with us saying, work with us, try to solve these problems and we will be there with our money. Um, in the, under the FAST Infra, one of the initiatives uh, we at the GIF are leading is developing a sustainable infrastructure label, which uh, would be coming in uh, as developers and um, are building, um, building assets, infrastructure assets, uh, that they would meet a certain sustainability criteria. Um, and from the financier side, they're interested in, in having such a um, 
such a label created is to um, be able to put their money and meet their requirements, uh, CSR or uh, sustainability requirements that they may have um, either from regulatory perspective or just uh, a good citizen perspective um, of uh, getting the assurances they need to put their uh, money in such uh, type of assets. Um, and then finally, uh, another uh, initiative that we are working with, um, with the UN led initiative uh, called the uh, GISD. So it's a group of 30 of the world's leading investors, corporate players together um, working uh, with them. The GIF is looking at uh, creating uh, credit enhancement and um, solutions to de-risk um, some, um, some risk in infrastructure projects that neither the private sector will be able to take nor um, the country uh, can afford to take. Uh, as well as looking at uh, um, setting up a sustainable uh, infrastructure um, facility. So just a, a, a few examples of uh, what we do beyond our uh, transaction preparation, structuring, bidding uh, work that uh, we have been leading. Thanks. Yeah, and the report will actually feature FAST Infra because it is a best practice example where you really see the private sector aligned behind Agenda 2030 and even just reading the initial reports they've done, um, clearly a commitment to, to building on not replicating that. Uh, I'm really glad you brought up, uh, Tafika, the SI label work that you're doing. Um, one thing our report found is there are a number of efforts to create these additional criteria, such as the sustainable infrastructure label. Um, one could also look to uh, uh, sort of new efforts by the US government, like the Blue Dot Network. There's a, a number of these, and, and I think they're really uh, well-intentioned to build behind um, these broader uh, quality principles um, from Osaka. But then the question becomes how you implement them on the ground. And, and there's a question that we got from Rock about how, what are the gaps that exist? So if you are looking in these developing countries and, and thinking about putting these, um, these new labels into place, what I wanna ask all the panelists, what they see is the major gaps. Um, in the report, we looked a little bit at an analogous example from USAID's activities uh, in the post-Soviet states on the tax structure system. And we really found it had to be this deep dedication to rebuilding the very systems themselves um, from everything from the technical capacity of ministries all the way through, um, as Tom calls, sort of the life cycle costs of, of different activities. So I want to ask, uh, maybe we'll start with Tom and then go to Steve on sort of, and then Topeka, what do you see as, as the gaps to making these new criteria, which are going to be really exciting and these new sort of labels um, meaningful to the government that are meant to use them both on the implementation side, but also potentially on the accountability side. Thank, thank you, Chris. I, I guess I'll answer two, two questions. I think to, to Rock's question about the gaps, and I think the gaps, and I think it's what everyone here is talking about, is the lack of well-designed, well-defined projects. The financing is there, but it's the importance of getting well-defined projects across the finish line for financing. I think that, that continues to be a challenge. And, and this is not a resource uh, argument, but in, for example, in Africa, last year, we put out a, a proposal window for energy projects in Africa. We received over 300 project opportunities for energy development in Africa, and we're only able to take a small slice of those 300. You know, those are things that could feed into that pipeline that, that Rock is talking about. I'm really interested in what we could said about SI, because I think that is, and Chris, so you and I talked about this earlier on the Blue Dot Network, is that for these um, quality standards or um, kind of overlay of standards um, to be effective, I think it's going to need to have an ability to unlock capital somewhere else. Um, and I think of like the Women's 2X initiative, you know, there's money being put into that for the Blue Dot Network or SI projects to make it commercially viable or make sense for people to take that next step and demonstrate that they meet these principles, whether it's CSR or other principles, um, human rights, labor rights, all the other principles that will be captured within a uh, standard like that. There has to be an ability to unlock new or unavailable un, um, capital. 
Great. Steve, do you have anything to add on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, sorry, is that an echo there? Yeah, okay. I think going back to, to looking at, um, you know, some of, some of the fundamental principles here when you're talking about SDG 9, um, if you look at that quickly, I mean, there's a real focus there on, on sustainable resilient infrastructure uh, and a real focus on technology. And I think particularly the infrastructure sector, and it's well recognized, is has not uh, adapted and moved forward very much over the last century, to be honest with you, in terms of the way we do things, how we plan, how we implement our projects, et cetera. And we haven't taken advantage, I don't think, as a, as a, as a, as a kind of um, uh, a profession, uh, uh, the sectors, to, uh, to move in that direction. So I think that that's an that's important thing. To, we know that the, the, the problems that were being faced uh, at a national level, the global level, Need, need, need a different solution to the business as usual. Um, and, and that's, that's a very diff difficult thing to, to change business as usual, to change the way infrastructure is, is planned and thought of in silos, to move towards more of a systems-based approach to understand how you can get maximum efficiency gains uh, from, from infrastructure decisions across, across sectors. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, in our experience, governments struggle with this because it's a big picture. It's very complex and it's very hard. So, yes, there's, there's effort needed in terms of constant capacity development, capacity building. Uh, and that's part of, part of the reason one of, one of our focus areas has also been supporting governments in really getting a good picture of the enabling environment. And when I talk about the enabling environment, I'm talking about policy, standards, codes, uh, resources, uh, availability, training, uh, you know, set, organizational setups. Uh, and seeing how governments can think through maybe re reorganizing uh, some aspects of these to better uh, able to respond to uh, the requirements that we're, we're seeing now. And we're talking about having no, uh, you know, difficult to find projects that are uh, bankable. Um, that again, is something we're seeing all the time from governments asking us, can you help us? We don't know how to to um, put this, this project proposal together to, uh, you know, to meet these requirements. Uh, and so we've, we've actually just been pulling together a lot of requirements across these 89 global infrastructure investors I was talking about to understand and each one of these has, has maybe the same kind of thing, but put in very different ways. It's, it's a very complex uh, thing to navigate for, for, for some countries. So, so we're, we're trying to also respond to the, to the needs uh, and support governments in understanding uh, what these requirements are and how they can respond to them, which which isn't just about a project. That, let's make a project proposal and write it in in this proposal. There are fundamental structural issues and issues within the enabling environment that need to be addressed to, to ensure that this happens in a sustainable way. So, so I think um, they're very big, they're very complex issues, but but starting to break them down, providing the evidence for better decision making to governments. That uh, through analysis can 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 realign the way they're doing business and responding to to uh, you know, private sector requirements uh, is is uh, is key uh, and something that we've been trying to focus on, but it needs more more work in these areas. I think. Yes, absolutely. I think that point on the enabling environment is so important, and maybe even more so uh, post COVID, when a lot of these um, infrastructure projects will have a pretty dramatic health and uh, social impacts. Uh, Tom, we got a question for you from Makoto. How does the U.S. persuade countries that their procurement systems should not just favor the lowest cost bids, but actually take the best value and life cycle costs into account? Um, and how do you incorporate sustainability considerations? Such a good question, because there is really, you know, you both bring it to light, the differences in costs, but also there is potentially a, a persuasion element. So um, do you want to respond to that great question, Tom? Sure, thank you. I saw that in the chat and thank you for following up. I'll try to be quick just given uh, the time, but I think the quality and life cycle cost isn't for everyone. I, I mean, there is, we look around the world, we can operate in over 100 countries. We have 16, 17 countries we're operating in. It has to be um, a commitment by the country. And I think our worldwide global procurement team has a very structured approach of engaging um, each country to understand are they at a point where they're able to incorporate life cycle cost value determinations? I mean, some of it is a simple uh, 
black and white question is, is the legal and regulatory structure in place that allows procurements to incorporate life cycle cost best value? If yes, then, then we can continue the conversation of does it make sense? Um, if no, then we just move on because it is difficult. But I think we get to the point where we're not persuading necessarily. It's countries are recognizing that they're making investments, unfortunately, in products that are not working. And they're looking for alternatives. It's, it's not an easy solution. I know this is something that Dan Rundy at CSI cares greatly about. Um, it's not an easy solution. And there's it's a long-term commitment uh, to procurement. Um, but sustainability is part and parcel of that life cycle cost. When you look at the life cycle cost of major investments, you look at um, look at the cost of the original equipment, the warranties, um, spare parts, the total cost of ownership to understand what the actual cost is. And that goes to the sustainability because if you have warranties and spare parts, and everything else, you have sustainability in that investment. So it's not for every every country and we're very, very careful in the countries we do operate in to make sure that they have those legal and regulatory frameworks in place that can implement best value life cycle cost analysis before we start investing our own resources in helping them get to the point where they want to get. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, thanks for those comments from Steve and Tom. Tafik, I just wanted to ask if you have any last comments. If not, I'm going to wrap up our discussion. Sorry, um, I hope this is better in terms of uh, the audio. Um, I just wanted to add on uh, QII, something that uh, is of critical importance, especially in our space where we're looking at bringing in uh, private financing, and that is uh, life cycle, of course, but also uh, the affordability of the project uh, from the government's perspective. I think there are a number of um, um, initiatives, governments desperate to bring in, uh, to deliver on, a uh, on an infrastructure uh, project because there is a demand uh, for the services um, and putting in significant um, putting in actually the balance sheet of the, the country at stake um, and um, helping governments uh, review those uh, um, investment opportunities, really understand uh, direct, indirect, hidden, uh, contingent costs that uh, may lie there um, is something that is uh, very uh, important because you could have a, a great uh, infrastructure solution but uh, where um, I have worked uh, in this part of the world uh, on a, uh, advising a government on a road project that was going to put 50% of the Ministry of Transport's budget um, in that single road. And the country needed many more roads than just one. So looking at those kind of uh, uh, issues are critical, especially when debt sustainability um, of countries is, uh, is, is of concern in, in many places. And as I say, again, this was uh, in 2019, we're in 2021, where public uh, countries have had to print money to just live through the, the pandemic. So th this issue will continue to be uh, an important one to look at, which is uh, deliver uh, solutions, but not at all costs and not uh, um, really mortgaging uh, mortgaging the future of the country. So, so uh, well said. a thing to look at. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, deep gratitude to our panelists today. I think they represent some of the most cutting edge new work in this space. So just really excited to feature some of that work in our upcoming report, which we'll be happy to share with everyone on this call. And of course, thanks especially to Tafika for being up so late and, and the different time zones that Steve is in and, and otherwise. Thank you so much to the CSIS team. Um, and thank you uh, to our sponsor for this event and for the paper Chevron, who's um, helped us make the time and space for this research possible. And to all of our attendees today, really appreciate your time and interest. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at the next CSIS event.